Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your host for this morning, Mr. Warwick Merry. Yeah, fantastic. So welcome everybody. Thank you for getting out here so early. For most of you who are tradies early, this is not early. This is just standard and we appreciate that. Um, before starting, as I said, my name is Warwick Merry. I'm gonna be your host for the entire breakfast series that's happening. Some of you might have seen me on video. Um, before starting, I just want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal people here today. Uh, I'd also like to thank Tradelink as our major sponsor for the, for the whole event series that we're having, the whole breakfast series, and also to our partners and their teams who are present. So Dean and Damien from Billy, where's Dean? Give us a wave. Oh, fantastic. I like Billy's on the thing. We know exactly who you are. People just call you Billy for the rest of the morning. Uh, Scott from Seabus, he was around. There he is over there. They're giving away a prize later on today, which is great. Karen from Vigo, I saw Karen flying around. Excellent. Oh, I like the little head wobble as you wave. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's sort of the sunglasses for the early morning, like it's bright in here. Let's sort of get on with it. Uh, Scott and Rebecca from Stiebel Eltron. There they are. A bit, there's just a finger in the air. It's not going to cut it. We need the big, yeah, here we are. That's what's going on. Uh, and Michael from SAI Global. Fantastic. There's a little bit of finger action. We like that. That's just nice. I know it's, I know it's early, uh, but we're going to get on. We have some important things that we want to cover today. Uh, when you're employing staff for your team, one of the most important documents you can use is, of course, the letter of offer. How do we make sure that we're doing the right thing out in the letter of offer and making sure that we're covering the rights of us as an employer and also that of our, our employees? So we've got someone who knows what needs to be in our letters of offer. Sean Melbourne is a senior employment lawyer and also has extensive experience in commercial litigation, which hopefully you'll never need. Uh, his areas and expertise cover all areas of employment law, including drafting employment contracts, policies, procedures, restructuring and transfers of business. And Master Plumbers members have access to a 15 minute free phone call from Sean as one of their member benefits. Today, he's going to be sharing with us the key elements of a letter of offer. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a master plumber's welcome to Sean Melbourne. Good morning. Thanks for that introduction. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about letters of offer today. And we just thought this would be really helpful because this is one of those things that it's easy to do and easy to get put in place. And if you put it in place right up front, it saves you a lot of headaches down the track. So, and we know that a lot of people um, sort of can skip over this, this detail when they employ someone. So we just want to give a few pointers about why it's important and how you can just easily do it. So first of all, what is a written offer? So it's a letter from you offering your, your potential employee employment on certain terms and conditions. Now you can do it either way. Some people like to have a a letter, a cover letter with, which attaches a contract, and some people just like to have a, a one letter that just sets out all the terms of the contract. Either way is fine, it just depends on how you like to do it. So once that offer is accepted by the employee, you'll have a binding contract of employment. So that's a contract that's recognised at law just like any other contract, like a, your terms of business or anything like that, and it, it can be enforceable as a legally binding contract. Um, now the contract a contract can't override an, an award or enterprise agreement, but it, it operates in conjunction with it. So awards or enterprise agreements set out minimum terms of employment, and a contract can either offer higher terms of employment than in an award, and it can also fill in the gaps with, that aren't covered by awards or enterprise agreements, because awards and enterprise agreements don't cover everything, so you need to have a contract in place for those terms that aren't covered. And then a question is often, does the employee actually need to sign the letter of offer? It's, a, it's definitely a good idea for them to sign it because then you'll have a, it'll be very clear that they have agreed to the offer and you'll ha it'll be clear what the terms of employment are. If they don't sign it, and I don't want to encourage you here, but usually if, if an employee has seen the offer and they've started work based on that offer, they'll be taken to have accepted it by their conduct. But that's just not a, that's not a good situation to be in because then you've got to have that whole argument. So you're better off just making sure your employee signs the contract before they start work. So do I actually need a written offer of employment? Well, you don't actually need one. You can, you can hire someone without a written offer, but it's definitely a good idea to have a written offer of employment and we, we highly recommend it. And there's a few reasons for it. And one is that as, as I said before, awards and enterprise agreements don't cover everything. So you want to make sure you have 
additional terms to protect your business. Um, and you can include in a, in a contract, uh, and I'll go over these in a moment, some terms that will give you extra protection for your business. Um, a written offer reduces uncertainty because when you, when you make a written offer of employment, it means that you and the employer have to actually look at the terms that you're employing them on, like what are their pay rates, how, they, how can they be terminated, will there be a probationary period, that sort of thing. So it turns people's minds to actually what the terms and conditions are. And it means that at that stage, if an employee wants to raise something or ask a question, then they can do that and you can work it out so it's all agreed to up front and you don't have uncertainty going forward in your employment relationship. A, a written offer will also handle things that you haven't thought of yet because when, when you offer someone employment, you don't really think about, well, how am I going to be able to terminate them? Will they be able to poach my clients when they leave? Those sorts of issues you don't really think about, but if you've got a good template offer of employment, that'll get sorted in that contract. And of course, you'll have less trips to the commission, which everybody likes, because you'll have much more certain terms of employment. So I'm just going to go over a few things that a, a contract will, a, a, an offer of employment will give you that you won't get otherwise, just to give you an idea of, of why they're important. So the first one is prob probationary periods. You can, you can say in your contract that this employee will be employed for maybe a three month probationary period or a six month probationary period, during which time you'll assess their suitability for the employment. And that means that you can, um, you usually have, also have a clause that says you can terminate for any reason, say with one week's notice during that time. And that just means that it's easier if, it, if it's clear early on that it's not working out with your employee, it's easy to end the relationship. And it also just means that everybody knows, the employee's clear as well, that they are on probation to start with and you're just finding out whether they are suitable for the job. So that's something you can have in a contract that, that you won't find in, the, in an award or usually an enterprise agreement. You can also have all-inclusive rates in a contract. So you could say you might want to pay an hourly rate that includes everything under the award. So it includes penalty rates, uh, overtime, uh, shift allowances, that sort of thing. So you can just have one all-inclusive rate if you want to pay that way so it's easier. That's something you can do in a contract. And then um, notice provisions. If you don't have a clause in, your, in a contract that says how much notice you have to give when you terminate someone's employment, the courts will imply a term that, that says that you have to provide reasonable notice to the employee. And what's reasonable is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So it just, and it'll depend on things like the age of the employee, their length of service, how senior they are, whether they can find alternative employment. So if you end up hiring someone and they stay in your business for five or six years, you might end up having to give, say, three or even six months notice of termination. So that's a, a headache that you'll end up having, having down the track. But if you've, got a clause, if you've got a clause in your contract that says that you can terminate on, say, four weeks notice, that that um, removes that whole potential problem. Now, there is some case law actually that's created doubt around this area, but for now, we, we just want to make sure that you have a, a notice provision in your, in your contracts. You can also include business protection provisions in your contract. So you might want to say, have a clause that says that the employee can't use any of your confidential information. So he's got to keep, you know, they can't share your pricing information, for instance. Or you might have a clause that says that the employee can't take any of your clients when they leave employment. That, that often becomes an issue down the track where an employee goes off and starts wanting to use your, um, you know, poach your customers. Or they, that they can't take with them other employees for a certain period of time after employment. So you can include those sorts of provisions in your contract to make sure that your business is protected. And then also in an employment contract, you can have entire agreement clauses. And what that means is often when you offer someone employment, you might make certain promises, like you might say, uh, you, you know, you'll get a certain amount of overtime if you work with me, or you'll you'll be able to you'll have secure employment for a long time, or those sorts of things that we can often say. But if you've got an entire agreement clause, it says that you can only rely on what's actually written in the contract. You can't rely on extraneous things that get said when you're offering someone employment. So, an employee can't say, "Oh, you promised me this, but you know, you're." Um, you know, you're not giving it to me now, because you can say, well, you're just only allowed to rely on what's in the contract. And that just gives you far more certainty about what the terms of employment actually are. So there are a few examples. There's a, uh, there's a, there's a lot more that you get benefit from from um, having a written contract, but there's sort of some main ones that just to go over. 
And then when should I issue the offer of employment? The best time is when you offer the employee the employment, is to give them a written offer that sets out the terms of employment. You don't want to be in a situation where an employee started work and then you give them a contract or you ask them to agree to terms, because that can create problems. So if you put your offer in place when you offer them employment, you'll be, you'll be well protected. And to get them to sign that offer before they start employment as well. And also keep in mind that verbal offers are enforceable. So sometimes people make verbal offers of employment thinking it's not, it, it, it'll just be dependent on a written contract. But if you've offered an employee employment and they accept it, you'll actually have a, you'll have a binding employment contract. And it, but it won't have any of the terms that we've just talked about that will protect your business. So that's a situation you don't want to be in either. So just make sure you, you give a written offer of employment when you actually offer that, person, that employee employment. So what should you have in a written, in a offer of employment? I'll just go over a few of these because I don't want to bore you to death, but um, these are some of the things that you want to include in an offer. And just so you know, you don't have to remember these because we've got template offers of employment that you can use. Master Plumbers has these. And we're actually going to provide them to you somehow in the in the show bags, yeah, yeah, they're in the, in the show bags you're getting today. So you're going to go home today with some template offers of employment that you can use that Master Plumbers has drafted to, that are industry specific. So um, that, that'll just make it easy for you to be able to put in place an offer of employment. So, so some of the things you want to have, you want to identify your company name that they're being employed by and the name of the employee. You want to have the start date. So when are they going to start? Is there an end date? Is, if it's a fixed term contract, you could put their employment will end on this particular date. Or you might say it'll end at the end of this project once, they, once they're no longer needed. Or you could just have an ongoing employment that is continuous. What's their position? You might even say what their classification will be under the award. Where are they going to work? Will they have a fixed work location or will they just work in different locations depending on where the jobs are? Will they be full-time, part-time or casual? Is there going to be a probationary period? And you can determine the length of that probationary period. You might identify the award that they're going to come under, or if there's an enterprise agreement in place, you can identify that in the contract, so it's very clear. Hours of work, are they, will they work, what, eight, nine to five, eight till four? Will they work Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday? It's good to have that sort of thing set out in the contract. Um, will they, what, what's their rate of pay? Is it going to be all inclusive? Is it going to include certain other, other conditions under the award? Um, and then super, you know, you, you've got to pay your 9.5% super, so you can set that out in the contract. What are their leave entitlements? Obligations and employees. So there you can just say things like the employee must act honestly, they must, be, they must do a good job, put in, um, you know, act diligently and act in good faith your business protection provisions that I talked about earlier, how much notice has to be given on termination. So sometimes with notice of termination, you can just include the scale from the NES, which goes from one to five weeks of, weeks of notice, depending on the length of service. Or you might just have a four week notice clause or a one month notice clause, depending on how you'd like to do it. And then the entire ag agreement clause as well. All right, so that's sort of a, a bit of a rundown on offers of employment. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask now? We will be having a, a Q&A session later on, but are there any questions now regarding offers of employment? Yeah. Is it better to remain silent and let it sit back to the award of the EBA or to outline specific uh, terms and conditions in the contract and have quite a lengthy contract? Uh, like whether you in, like set out what's actually in the EA in the contract? I actually... You'll probably get different answers on this from different people, but I prefer not to set out, not to repeat award conditions or EA conditions in a contract. Because what happens then is that means that the employee has an entitlement to those things, both under the EA or the award and the contract. And it's not, it's not really needed. So if something's already in the EA or the award, it's better just to leave it in there and then just use the contract to to refer to other things. Sometimes people do say, you know, you've been told to this much, these allowances per the award. Sometimes people set that out just so it's all clear, and that's okay, but generally speaking, I don't, I, I prefer not to, to repeat if it's, if it's possible not to do that. Yeah. Any other? Oh, yeah. 
So when conditions change in contracts like during the term of employment, I, I take it that contract lasts the whole duration of someone's employment. Yeah. Um, what's the process if you want to change companies or conditions for that employee? Oh, yeah. What was that last part, sorry? Can you, yeah, can you just to start a new contract at any time? What's the process? Yeah, as long as the employee agrees to it, you can. So if you're adjusting a minor term, like maybe say you're increasing their pay rate and that's all, you could just you could send them a letter or email saying this is what we're, we're making this change um, and you know have them agree to it. Or if you're sort of making more... Uh, Changes in that you might just re, you might just reissue the, the letter of offer with those new terms in it and get the employee to change it. So as long as the employee agrees to it, you can change a contract pretty much any time. If they don't agree to it, you've got a little bit more work to do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean you can if they're not agreeing to it, you can do things like say you're giving pay increases that aren't per say an EA, they're not mandated pay increases, or you're giving an extra condition of employment you can make that conditional on them signing a new contract, but you can't make signing a new contract conditional on getting entitlements they already get under the award. Yeah, but it's always, if, it's always best to try and get the employee's agreement. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. This is my only morning workout. <laughs> um, how enforceable are uh, um, for example, you're saying you could have a termination at notice of four weeks um, yeah. if the NES has those other um, stipulations of so much time for, say, one year, so much time for three years and five years and so on. Yeah, for, the, for notice so of termination? You, yeah, so if you're going to make it four weeks um, notice, yeah. uh, how, how could that be if it um, is in contradiction of the NES? Oh, yeah, so the, so the NES notice periods are, are minimum periods. So you can still agree in a contract to have a higher notice period. So, yeah, so you could say an employee, if an employee's only been there for less than a year, they're entitled to one week's notice, but you can still have in a contract that they're entitled to four weeks notice. As long as your contract's higher than the NES, it'll still be enforceable. Just one thing to watch with the NES is they actually, the NES provisions actually go up to five weeks notice. So if you have a contract that says that you're entitled to four weeks notice, that, that could end up being contrary to the NES if the employee's there long enough. So if they're there for, I think it's over five years, and they're aged over 45, they get five weeks notice. So you, your contract really should, I, I, what I like to put in a contract is you, you'll get four weeks notice plus if, and if the NES or a, an award provides for more, then you're entitled to that. So that just covers you off. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Rightio. All right. I think we're done. Ladies Thank and you. gentlemen, Sean Melbourne. Thank you.